what we're trying to accomplish, whether whatever our goals are, objectives, as long as we stay in the game, we're going to find success. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. It might not even be next month. But if we stay in the game, success is guaranteed. If you quit, the guarantee is you fail. Hi, I'm Devon Harris. Welcome to Keep On Pushing TV, where we share ideas and insights that are going to challenge you and inspire you to keep on pushing and live your absolute best life. So welcome. If you haven't done so yet, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. In fact, give us a like as well because it helps to grow the channel. We'd really love to get your help on that. In this episode, I get to hang out with speaker and humorist Joel Zeff. He started his professional career as a newspaper journalist and a public relations executive, but soon found the stage with his interactive, hilarious performances. Joel believes that organizations and individuals should celebrate everyday successes in order to increase collaboration, productivity, passion, and innovation. So enjoy. This is Keep On Pushing TV with Devin Harris. Hey, Joel, uh, it's so great to have you. Welcome to Keep On Pushing. Thank you, Devin. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Mr. Tada. It's, uh, it's awesome to connect. So you, you, you believe in, you practice, you talk about celebrating. Cele how, and I believe in celebrating our successes. But tell me, Joel, in, in what ways do you think you know, celebration increases, you know, production, productivity and innovation, collaboration and so on. Well, when I started speaking, my background, I had two backgrounds. I had a journalism business background and then I had this improvisational comedy background and I found a way to combine the two. And so I was talking about the choices that improv taught me and it kind of filtered through my business experience. And part of when I when I started speaking, my kids were uh, well, when I first started speaking, I didn't have kids, but uh, as when I, uh, a few years later uh, and I had kids, everything was a celebration. Everything was a ta-da. When they're, when they're little, everything they do is a big ta-da. They eat a cheese sandwich, ta-da! You know, they do a little drawing, ta-da! Everything, we celebrated everything they did and that fueled their energy. They wanted to do more. And so I kind of took that energy, that ta-da energy and kind of put it together with what I was talking about the choices of improv. And that celebration is that energy that pops the support. And in improvisation, when we perform, you know, that applause, that laughter fueled us. The more we laugh, the more laughter and applause we got as performers, the more we wanted to do, the more creative, the more risks we took, uh, the better we performed as teammates, as leaders. We, we created more because we were receiving that positive energy. And that ta-da is part of that. Uh, most people don't get a round of applause at their jobs. I have a job where I get a round of applause. It's pretty awesome. We still need that energy. Everybody deserves that positive round of applause. And if you don't have a job where you get a round of applause, then you have to give it yourself. So whether it's a round of applause to kind of key that energy up or it's that big ta-da, it keeps, it fuels us, it keeps our energy uh, up and our passion, and what that means is innovation, success, uh, better teamwork, more exciting leadership. That's what we're after. Yeah, it's kind of interesting as you you mentioned uh, your kids and how you celebrated uh, every little success. And uh, you know, it got me to thinking back to when my kids were growing up. And you're absolutely right. Even as they're older, um, you know, they hit the honor roll like we just had a cause for celebration for my two daughters who just hit the honor roll. Um, yeah. And that's a big celebration, but and I, we have to celebrate everything, little things as we work, all these celebrations keep that energy going. Yeah, absolutely. But it seems um, what, what I'm hearing from you, and I think it's true that as we grow older, though, we kind of lose, I guess, the, the desire to applaud others and we, kind of get accustomed to not uh, being celebrated the way we were celebrated when we were younger. You're absolutely right. As we get older, it takes more and more for us to have 
that tada, and that that affects us, right? Uh, especially at work, we had to wait, wait. We wait once a year for an awards presentation. You know, we don't get enough appreciation in our work lives, and if we don't have that appreciation, you know, what are we going to create? Are we going to be the best that we can be? Are we going to be able to deal with change effectively? Are we going to be a great teammate? Are we going to be able to take care of the customer, take care of our team? You know, we need that tada, and we can't just wait for it, and we can't. It, we can't just rely on leaders. Everybody needs to be creating that to the energy, that positive support, because that's our fuel. We want to keep our passion up and our stress down. And to keep that passion up, we need that fuel. Turn up, stress down. You, you know, I, I've watched uh, videos of you on stage, and you are just bouncing off the walls. Basically, <laughs> is that how you are normally? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. I get that question a lot. Uh, no, because I would, people would think I was just, uh, you know, just nuts, right? You have to, I, I kind of save up that energy before I performed, before I had that outlet, I was probably more like that. It was, you know, I just had this, you know, this energy, this, this starburst that would just constantly finding a way an outlet. And once I started, uh, once I found that outlet in performing, when I first started doing stand up and then improvisational comedy, and then of course speaking, it 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 kind of it directed that energy and so you know i kind of use up that energy when i'm on stage and then it and then uh most of the time you know i kind of come down a little more that spirit that i come down a little more because I'm, 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 yeah I'm, it's too i'm too i'm too wound up when i when i perform it'd yeah. be too much people people would stay away from me Devin. people wouldn't even talk to me I'm, if I'm i was sure. like that all the I'm time sure. So you mentioned that he had two careers and for a minute, I'm like, man, he's almost on in Jamaican. What's going on here? You know, with multiple jobs. But so you, you're improv and you were, were you a newspaper reporter? I did. That's a, that was my degree, journalism, newspaper. I was a, a newspaper reporter. That's, um, I'm very proud of that. And then I went into advertising and marketing and PR. And uh, in 1991, I lost my job as a newspaper reporter. The paper, the newspaper closed. Uh, and so I had a lot of free time. I was single and I had a severance check. So that's a lot of, that's a, that's like just perfect. Right? That's a single guy's dream world there. Yeah, it's perfect. And, uh, and so I started doing stand up. I found a club and I started doing stand up. I started taking, uh, I took a couple workshops about improvisation and it just, that's, you know, I kind of found my calling. And it just kind of progressed. And I, what sparked I auditioned. that interest initially, Joel, uh, to go from, you know, well, newspaper reporter to marketing to, hey, I think I want to do uh, improv. Comedy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when I first moved to Dallas, uh, a friend of mine that worked at the newspaper took me to an improv comedy club. Uh, and I, I, at that time, I didn't really knew, know, I had been to an improv show, but I wasn't really familiar with what improv was. And so they took me to a show and it was just like, ah! I mean, it was like, kind of like a Disney movie, like where the light just kind of shines on the, the main character and you're like, ah! it was, it, it was eye opening. It was, it was a magical experience because I realized that's what I wanted to do. And now I just got to figure out how to do it. And so uh, I always w was interested in comedy. I did a stand-up comedy routine in eighth grade at the eighth grade talent show where I just did impressions of teachers. <laughs> I can't believe I wasn't expelled, but apparently, uh, but I did stand-up and I did comedy and, and that was always uh, part of me. And when I went to college, I had these two, you know, there's, there, was, there was kind of two personalities. There was the very responsible uh, business, I need a career, uh, you know, personality, and that kind of focused on journalism and, and then went into advertising PR. But at the same time, I had this love of comedy, this love of performing. And I found a way to combine the two um, years in the mid 90s. So I after I, I was a newspaper reporter, when the paper closed, I kind of, I said, well, I have a lot of free time. So I started doing comedy, started doing stand up around town. And going to open mics, uh, taking workshops with the improv group. And, uh, and then was, and then I got um, invited to be part of the, part of the group at the same time I was doing that. 
the responsible personality. I got a job at a, at a PR agency and then an ad agency. And so it was kind of these two very diverse directions, right? And I found a way for them to come together uh, when one of my clients, one of my PR clients, Texas Instruments, uh, was having a retreat, an executive retreat. And they said, hey, we know on the weekend you do improv. Can you come up and do some improv with us before dinner? And I was like, really? And so it was all VP level, all men, right? And technology people. So mm -hmm. if you're like, hey, what could be the worst audience that you could put together? This, you would create this. Yeah. It ended up, they had a blast. I took another guy with me. We played improv games. We had no idea what we were going to do. We were just, we were just, you know, we we're just throwing stuff up at the wall. They had an awesome time. More importantly, I had an awesome time. And I said, I could offer this to other clients. You know, it's that kind of finding that opportunity when opportunity knocks, you know, answer the door, right? That's the cliche. cliche. And it, it was really literally smacked me in the face. And I said, well, maybe I could offer this to other clients. And, but I never thought it was going to be a career. And just like anything, you do a great job. People come and find you. Your name gets passed around. And so uh, I was doing more and more. And it basically at that time I was on my own doing PR and marketing uh, as a as a my own business, and it just kept taking over more and more of my business. And about 1999 2000, it had really taken over my business, uh, doing improv as a keynote, as uh, working with corporate clients, associations, healthcare, schools, using improv to talk about teamwork, leadership, change, passion, and and all of a sudden a new career was born. And that's the story. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's interesting because let's talk, uh, you know, to those people who find themselves in a career that um, it's not necessarily a dead end. You know, they may be achieving some success, uh, but they're not necessarily totally fulfilled. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know that you were not necessarily fulfilled as a as a newspaper reporter. You they, they kind of. Um, invited you to go elsewhere. Um, but you came into this uh, new field you know, of, of comedy and improvisation and hence a, a speaker. A apart from just kind of, you, you said it found you, what, what um, I think, I guess things fell in place that allowed you to kind of blossom in this area? Well, I put myself in the right position to take advantage of that, that opportunity. And, you know, I was on a path because I had discovered something that I truly loved, comedy and improv. And I was going down that path. And I didn't know where that path was going to take me. I just knew I loved what I was doing. And I didn't really necessarily care whether I got paid for it or not. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you'd get a little money. Sometimes you'd get a gift card. Sometimes you, you know, get nothing. Get a, get a, I, I remember when I first started speaking, if, if somebody gave me a sweatshirt or a, or a paperweight clock, I was thrilled. I was like, are you kidding me? Right. If, if somebody gave me like a Chili's gift card, I was like, oh my God, I'm rich, rich in Chili's gift cards, baby. You know, I mean, that was it. I was like, you, you, they gave me $50 in Chili's gift cards and a sweatshirt to play improv games yeah. with them. That's true. Cause I loved what I was doing. And I tell people all the time, you know, when, when you're trying to figure out what you want to do, figure out what you would do for free and focus on that, that you love so much, something that you love so much that you don't really care whether you get paid or not. Now, you obviously want to get paid. Uh, you want to make a living. But something you love so much, you don't it, money is not the first thing. You're not concerned about how much you're making. You're not concerned about what your salary is, what the benefits are. All you're concerned about is that you get to be this or you get to do this. And when you kind of start going down that path, all of a sudden opportunity is created, doors open. And some of them you create yourself and some of them just by the circumstances. You know, I started, I loved improv. One of my PR clients, Texas Instruments, knew I did improv on the weekend. So an opportunity was created. Hey, come play improv games with, uh, with our team. And then next thing you know, uh, you know, uh, somebody mentions it to somebody else. I say it to somebody else. 
I do this job, which creates another job, which creates another job. At that point, I'm still not thinking this is a career. I'm still not thinking this is going to be uh, a big piece of pie. This is just something fun to do because I love it. And I, and you know, you got to take those first steps and that first step, you know, you, you take those first steps, all of a sudden you've gone a mile and then you've gone 10 miles and you've gone 20, you know, and, and you turn around you realize how far you've come and what you've accomplished and what you've done and more opportunities are created because you're putting that energy, you're putting your energy into it. You're putting your effort into it. Yeah. It's, you know, you're, and you hear it all the time and you, you know, it's does sound like a cliche, but it's so true. You know, you do the things that you love. Now I get it that people, we all live in the real world. And as you say, you know, people want to get paid. They have to earn a living. They need to yep. put food on the table and a roof over their head. But if you can figure out how to monetize that which you love, then it becomes easier. I don't want to give the impression that it's easy because you No, it's you, it's work. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely work. You're absolutely right. And it's, you know, but focus on the industries that you love. If you know, uh there's there's multi-billion dollar industries in everything. You've got to figure out what you love to do and and find your way, whether, you know, you love sports or you love, um, you know, like my, my brother-in-law, I remember having a conversation with him uh, when he graduated school years ago about what he wanted to do. He was working at a bank and he wasn't fulfilled. Um, and we, my wife and I were talking to him about what do you love to do? What do you love to do? And, and you know, hunting, he loved to hunt and he loved to work out. Well, there's two huge industries right there. So go toward the what you love to do and figure out there's a there's a job there for you. There's there's an opportunity for you. He ended up starting uh, uh, his own gym, and I think it just celebrated its tenth anniversary, or or might even be ten or twelve years uh, later, because he followed what he loved to do. Indeed, indeed. So, um, you know, you talk about uh, taking ownership and responsibility for your own happiness and your own success, which I so dig as well. I believe that. Um, most people don't, though, Joel. They, they blame fate. They blame circumstances. They blame everybody else. What is the key, you think, to, um, you know, taking that personal responsibility? I think it's it's really choice. You know, an improv is all about choices. We improv is about, you know, there for those in your audience that may not be familiar with improvisation, there's no script, there's no rehearsal, there's no plan. Everything is happens right there in real time. So it's all about choices, right? Choices. You're trying to choose uh, you know, uh what you want to do, you're choosing what you're saying, you're choosing what's happening. And so when you're making those choices, right, you're trying to find success as a team, you're trying to find a success, you're meeting your objective, which is to make the audience laugh or to create something. And so just like when we talk about career, it is all choices. What are your choices? And is everything gonna happen in one day? No, is everything gonna happen in a week? No, it's taking those little steps and you realize how far you've come. You know, you realize you do a little something each day to move the goal forward to where you want to be, to what you want to do. And, you know, figuring that out and moving toward that is part of the process. And it takes time. One of my key messages that I talk about is staying in the game. Improv taught me, you can do anything you want in improv. You can make a mistake. You can say something stupid. I've done it many, many times. I've probably already done it today with you, Devin, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually keeping count. <laughs> are you keeping count? I'm sure. I make mistakes all the time. You got to own them. You got to own those mistakes. And you know what? Um, you're you're going to make mistakes. That's what improv is about. You can't be afraid to make those mistakes. Uh, you learn from them and you move forward. And the key message there is to stay in the game. If you stay in the game, you're going to find a way to be successful in improvisation. You're, you're going to find a way. Somebody says something that doesn't work. Somebody says something that didn't make sense or went off track. But if you stay in the game, you're going to find a way for that game to be successful. And you take it to our work lives, what we're trying to accomplish, whether whatever our goals are, objectives. As long as we stay in the game, we're going to find success. 
It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. It might not even be next month. But if we stay in the game, success is guaranteed. If you quit, the guarantee is you fail. And I'm not saying quit your job. I'm saying we quit goals, initiatives, challenges. If we quit, the, you're guaranteed you failed. If you stay in the game, success is there. And that means you have to learn something new or get out of your comfort zone or work harder. But it is there if you want it. You just have to stay in the game. You know, and you're, 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 you're a perfect example of that, Devin. Yeah, well, you know, you said that that's a perfect example. I just have to I feel like I need to unpack, man, because it's, it's so true. You know, earlier you talk about um, uh, opportunities and, and the fact that you have to work them because the challenge is a lot of people, when they hear the word opportunities, they think in, in terms of, hey, this is a gift that I just need to unwrap and enjoy the contents therein. And what you're saying is certainly in your life, the opportunity to become, uh, 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 to do improv appeared and then to do improv and speaking appeared, so to speak, but it involved work. And then you it had involved, to kind of yeah. stay in the game. It's yeah, it involved a lot of work. I mean, I was doing stand up four times, at least four times a week. Sometimes we do multiple shows. We'd go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, you know, and then uh, I would take workshops at the same time. Uh, we would, we would, I would, I, I've done stand up on a beach. I've done stand up on a, in a parking lot. I've done stand up on a porch. You name the bad location. I've done coffee houses and, and bar, back of bars and, and performing improv and, and stand up and, and improv. Uh, uh, you know, thousands and thousands. I've probably done, you know, we're, we're talking uh, thousands and thousands of stand up shows and thousands and thousands of improv shows. And they're not all, in a beautiful theater with an adoring crowd, they're in a parking lot or a, right. or a porch. So, you know, we somebody talk call about an amphitheater. Completely, we talk about life and the fact that you have to have a vision, you have to have you know goals and create plans. But as I was listening to you talk about improv, it it struck me that there's a big part of life that that is all about improvisation, that we're we're really making it up as we go. And the key to succeed at this particular improv game that we call life is to stay in the game, as you're pointing out. Yep. I mean, you nailed it. We're all absolutely, we're all improvising. We all have choices. We're trying to make the best choice possible. That's, that's the key. Improv is all about trying to make the best choice possible, not being afraid to make a mistake uh, and being confident and really trying to create opportunity for each other. You know, another big aspect of, of improv, because you're, you're not doing it by yourself, you're doing it with a team, is that you're helping each other be successful. You're helping all the people around you, asking that question every day, how do I help the people around me be successful? And answering that question and acting on it. Yeah, uh, and uh, again, something important that you said, it just uh, resonated with me. The idea that um, if you give up, Oh yeah. Sure. Joel, are you there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm hearing something. Are you hearing it? So one of the things you, you spoke about was the fact that, you know, in the improv game, if you quit, the only time you fail is if you quit. And right. it's one of those messages that I deliver as a speaker well about persistence, about yep. your ability to keep on pushing that, you know, yeah, you will you will fail, you will fail, you'll have setback. Well, you'll have setbacks, you will miss the mark. But the only time you truly fail is when you give up, is when you quit right. on pursuing yeah. the dream. That's why I love talking to speakers like you is that you know we have different backgrounds, but so much of what made each of us successful in our own worlds are the exact same things. Right. We may use different words, but it's the exact same message. And it's so cool for audiences to see people. Uh, you know, I come from this improvisational background. You come from, you know, a sport uh, background. But the same skills uh, that made each of us successful in our own fields, they're the same. We're, we're not trying. Neither one of us are reinventing the wheel here, but we're just trying to tell people our experience 
Uh, and you know, some people respond to this and some people respond to that, but the more they hear, Hey, here's how this person did it. Here's how this person, the same messages of staying in the game and not quitting and helping your team be successful and creating opportunity. It, it, everybody has the same, they might use different words, but it's the same, same key points. And I think what you're illustrating is a, is the fact that success principles are universal. And so Absolutely. what happens, yep. um, you know, both of us are speakers in my world and your world are, are the same if we apply the principles, but it means then that because they are universal principles, somebody can apply them in their world and achieve, let's say, similar results, achieve successful results because the principles are eternal. Exactly. Yeah. Whether they're in sales or leadership or management, uh, you know, or marketing or HR or IT or accounting, you name it, 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 it applies. You know, yeah. we're all trying to find our way. And we're all trying to find success. We're all trying to to be be passionate and be happy. I hope. I'm not really interested if you're not. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. No, um, as you just, just use the word leadership. And, and I think of the companies that we both work with, you know, obviously we are uh, working to impact them in, in very different ways. And I speak all the time about the fact that we are leaders in our own right. So you're on stage and you're leading this uh, these improv improvised games. Mm -hmm. um, yep. How willing are your participants, uh, first of all? So are they really interested in having fun? And uh, what kind of impact do you think you are making uh, uh, through the lessons you are teaching? Now, Devin, now I have to remember back when I did live events. Remember that? that was oh, yes. Good we times. Talk about that, yes. <laughs> we got to remember back when we did live events. That was fun. Um, so uh, back when I did live events and had people come up on stage and do Im Im improvisational games with me, it, it was awesome because, um, you know, I asked for volunteers. Sometimes I had, I would have to pick somebody, but they were all successful, probably in the thousands and thousands of people that came up and joined me for improvisational gaming. And I've, I've done, I don't know, 2,200 corporate events, something in that range, maybe more. It's not like I counted them. Uh, but somewhere around that range, and I could probably maybe a couple who were probably inebriated and just quit <laughs> early in my career when I realized you shouldn't have drunk people come up on stage with you, which is pretty much a key should be a t-shirt. Exactly. <laughs> don't, don't have drunk people come on stage with you. Um, but now when I do virtual, I kind of talk about, yeah, I, I certainly we do Tada and we do some other things, but. I talk about the choices that we did in these improv games and what, uh, you know, what all seeing all these uh, team members and associates and audience members play these improv games and making the same choices and the choices, you know, that I share in, in these virtual events with energy and fun and the choice of, you know, we talk about teamwork, helping each other be successful. We talk about creating opportunity and the importance of the ta-da and the positive support to fuel us. And certainly how we deal with change and disruption, right? Because we're all dealing with tremendous amount of change and disruption. And improv is constant change and disruption. And it's giving you choices. And improv is teaching you how to be effective within that change, within that disruption, as a team, as an individual, how to be innovative, how to be a great teammate, how to be a great leader, just by making certain choices. And, and, and I kind of really focus on just making these easy choices being prepared for change, being open and flexible within change and being present and in the moment with your team, with the people you're working with when you're in change and disruption to help each other be successful. Yeah, you know, what I speak all the time, and obviously it's true that none of us are getting through this global pandemic uh, brought on by COVID-19 on skates, right? We are all impacted in some way, shape or form. Some obviously, um, uh, more significantly than others. And I think our industry is, uh, and you and I are perfect examples of that, where we were accustomed to jetting across the country and around the world a little bit uh, and speaking to, you know, huge audiences. And now we are, you know, for want of a better term, relegated to a Zoom call, a webinar. Yeah. 
And uh, we have to make our own lunch, Devin. There's no buffet. Exactly. Oh, but, oh you know Man, what? I missed the buffet. That's probably perhaps the most hurtful part. <laughs> oh, especially when they, ooh, when they, when they had like the chef make like certain special things. Mm, yeah. Um, uh, nobody but, talks but, about the food. But, but here's the thing though, Joe, in the same way that we are talking to our audiences about the need to be innovative and adaptable and flexible, uh, in the way that we are pivoting our businesses, we are um, demonstrating the importance and need to be innovative and adaptable and to embrace change and recognize that, yeah, you always have a choice as we were discussing before. Um, how different, uh, if you can uh, describe that, is, you know, presenting a tada moment uh, via Zoom compared to being on stage? Um, it, it's actually, I've transitioned quite uh, easily. And uh, I think people are just, they're hungry for any type of, anybody on a Zoom call that has energy, anybody on a Zoom call that, that, it, that understands how to talk to a camera, uh, anybody that, that you know, can, can translate some fun, uh, through Zoom or WebEx or Teams or you name it, I've been been all, all of them, and so it's the transition for me has been easy. I miss the applause, I miss the live, I miss the laughter, you know, I miss uh, that energy, and you just kind of have to, in my mind, you're just like, oh, I'm getting that energy. I mean, they're they're all sitting at home, laughing and applauding, and I'm just in my mind, I'm hearing it, and you just kind of create that energy, and you know. Uh, people are hungry for it. Um, they they need uh, that that motivation. They need um, that breath of you know energy and fun and spirit and and passion. And people are uh, whether it's you know I've done ten minutes and thirty minutes and twenty minutes. You, you, you've done the same. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and whether I'm doing it here in my home office studio or I've had the opportunity to go to a studio. Um, two or three times to, you know, uh, and people are just now figuring out, I think these virtual events. And, and I always say we're in the AOL setting you a CD disc timeframe of virtual events. That's where we are. We're in, you know, we're in dial up. We're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and you're, and you're in an AOL chat room. That's where we are, you know, uh, in the timeline of these virtual events, think where we're going to be in six months or a year. And I'm not saying the pandemic is going to last that long, but I don't think virtual events are going to go away. When the pandemic is over, virtual events are going to be a part of the communication process, part of the marketing process, you know, whether they're a hybrid event, whether they're in addition to live events, I don't think they're going to go away. Um, some events are going to be virtual instead of live. Some events are going to stay live. Some are going to be a hybrid. They're not going away. And uh, yesterday, I did an event where I was speaking, and it was in a virtual world. It was like you're in a computer game, and you created an avatar, and you're in like it's like you know it's like my son plays Minecraft. It was like Minecraft, except there were no zombies, mm. right? And you you weren't building something, but you're in this world, in this virtual world, you know, and you can go up to talk to people. You know, you're an avatar; they're an avatar. It was really you know this the innovation is just now starting uh, and it's going to be exciting to see what happens next. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. The, the, the virtual uh, uh, meetings are going to be part of the meeting landscape for sure. Um, so we, it kind of takes us full circle, I think, to our conversation because we started out talking about celebration. And as we enter into this virtual world, um, yeah, we, you and I can do our presentations, you know, the worker uh, working remotely can do their jobs. Um, and, and while you may feel a sense of success, there, there's an element that's missing and it is the, I guess, the, the, the spontaneous celebration of the performance. Uh, and, you know, you may and I may create a mind game and go, yep, they're, they're, they're this is when they yeah. would normally cheer and they're cheering. I am awesome. Every time, kind of every thing. virtual event, right. I am just awesome. You are too, Devin. You are too. Yeah. You're awesome too. And, and, nobody's, and nobody turned off the screen. So you're like, yeah, cool. 
how 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 does what advice do you have for Joe Schmokes, Mary Jane, who is home, um, busting it out just as hard as he or she would in the office, but not necessarily getting that that immediate feedback? You know, we in this change and disruption, obviously, uh, where a lot of us are working differently. I've always worked from home, uh, you know, and so I, I worked from home for, you know, since the mid 90s. So I was used to it. But then I would leave and go and be with an audience of people and I would get that interaction and that connection. I don't even have that now. I just have the have the Zoom. Thank, thank goodness you called me today, Devin, or I, I wouldn't been <laughs> able been to talk to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to make that connection, right? And I, if you're working from home, you've got to keep those connections, whether it's, you know, via Zoom or um, taking a walk or, um, but you've got to reach out. You can't just wait for somebody to, to reach out to you. You've got to reach out to them and, and have those connections. And, and um, you know, I was on a I did an event for a client. They did a team meet, team meeting. I, I, there was forty or fifty, and you know, there was some really creative um, things that you can do on these calls that kind of bring us together. They did my client. They had everybody grab something from their home office because they're all working at home. Grab something from their home office that you know really connects to them or inspires them, and share with the group what this item why this item means so much to them and you know and and so they it was kind of a it was a show and tell for adults basically right remember when we were kids and we yeah. had show and tell it was show and tell and it was so rewarding it was so inspiring because you you're making that connection and each person talked for you know 90 seconds you know to talk about their item and and why it meant so much to them and so you learn you connected more with that person you learn more about that person and in the end, that helps all of us make that connection, keep, you know, keep that connection with each other. And it, it also is important because it fuels us. That's, you know, that inspiration fuels us, that connection fuels us. And we remember when we talked about to and passion and energy, we got to have that fuel and we get that fuel uh, many different ways. And that's just one of them. Yeah. So I, I know you're able to finally put that journalism degree uh, to work, and you wrote a book. Uh, I did. I made talk words to us about that. Yes, I, I made words, Devin. <laughs> and actually, that my, I'm gonna be honest with you. The book is um, last fall, 13 years. It came out in 2007. What? what? I gotta write another book, Devin. <laughs> Make the right choice. It's called Make the Right Choice: Creating a Positive, Innovative, and Productive Work Life. And it's still available on Amazon, or fine books are sold, or used books, or or just connect with me and I'll, I got a couple copies. Um, but it focuses on my messages, my, the messages of improvisation, the message I talk about uh, in uh, when I speak. And uh, I need to write another book, Devin. I need to I write another book. I think you should put that I, in. Uh, I should get, I wish, I wish I had some time to just be at home. I wish that, wait, I think I do. I think I have time. Devin, yeah. I have not used my time wisely. You are, you are at home, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. You uh, you've written a book, haven't you, Devin? I've written two, and two. I don't even have a journalism degree. See, oh, man. maybe I should write another it's one. It's hard. I'm yeah. One too. Uh, yeah, yeah. You got to see. Here's the problem with the journalism degree: is that you're taught to write on deadline, right? You have to have somebody breathing down your neck, and usually, uh, newspaper editors would be using choice words as they're breathing down your neck to get the copy. And gotcha. so if I don't have that deadline, it's hard for me to write. I need that. That's what journalism, spending so much time working for newspapers, I'm used to a deadline. And now when I don't have a deadline, I was like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Cool. I got I to gotta work on it. I'm on it, Devin. I'm on it. All I'm right. All right. It. So tomorrow though, or the day after somebody may want you to come in and share your tada moments, your, 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 um, your, ideas around making the right choice and celebrating life every single day. How would they find you? Uh, just really easy. Now it's so easy nowadays, right? If you can't, you know, it's just joelzeff.com uh, is my website, but you can find me on LinkedIn, just Joel Zeff. And then uh, you can find me on Facebook too, 
uh, the Joel Zeff at the Joel Zeff on Facebook. Just put a the. There's three Joel Zeffs on Facebook, Devin. Uh, and so if you want to find me, the it, it it's pretty easy to figure out which one I am. <laughs> but if you want to go and find me, the Joel Zeff, uh, Joel Zeff dot com. It's pretty easy to find me. JoelZeff.com, the JoelZeff on Facebook and JoelZeff on LinkedIn. That's where yes, you sir. find Mr. Tada himself. Hey, Joel, right. this has been awesome. And I've really enjoyed our time chatting uh, because even though you're a newspaper guy and an improv guy, you, you, you're pretty cool, I have to admit, you know. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Devin. You're um, cool too. Well, you know, I'm a bobsled that comes with the territory, man. Yeah, it's say? like, is there ever, is there an uncool bobsledder? Is there no, a guy that, I'm not there, met one is there yet. ever a guy that went, you know, that bobsledder guy over there? Uncool. Totally yeah, uncool. Well, we do operate in a cold environment for starters. Yeah. So, so you're naturally cool is what you're saying. Yeah. That, well, you know, just again, goes with the territory. So yeah, my man. I don't think there's ever been an uncool bobsledder, but it's been an honor talking to you too, Devin. This is a lot yeah. of fun. I love talking to successful people and, and learning about them and connecting and, and, uh, you know, and you inspire me, uh, and it's just, uh, it's awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, man. Thank you. So, uh, you know, uh, you, you do epidemize to keep on pushing a philosopher, my friend, uh, the growth, the, the stick to itiveness, staying into staying in the game is what we're all about here. Thank you for sharing that, that, that philosophy, your wisdom and your experience, uh, experiences keep on pushing awesome thank you